Good day, Grade 12, and welcome to our virtual tourism classroom. My name is Penny Forsler. I'm a tourism teacher in the Nelson Mandela Bay District, and I'm going to be presenting today's lesson on culture and heritage. This is the first part in a series of two lessons based on World Heritage Sites in South Africa. Before I start, let me acknowledge the huge role played by Erika Ferreira, who is the subject advisor for Nelson Mandela Bay Zone 1 for Tourism. Erika has compiled all of this material that you will be seeing in today's lesson. And I'd also like to acknowledge the role played by the e-teaching and learning directorate of the Eastern Cape Department of Education. They have made these virtual lessons possible. If we then take a look at your curriculum, and you will see that that is what you are required to learn this year under the main topic of culture and heritage. When we look at World Heritage Sites, we're first going to look at the concept. What is a World Heritage Site? Thereafter, we take a look at the role of UNESCO, as well as different types of World Heritage Sites. Now, the third bullet on your screen um, contains three subsections. First is a description of the World Heritage Sites in South Africa, their location on a map, and how they meet UNESCO criteria. We will be doing the second subsection in today's lesson, the location of the World Heritage Sites in South Africa on a map. Um, but the description of the World Heritage Sites and how they meet UNESCO criteria will come up in part two of this lesson. And then thereafter, we'll take a look at the value of World Heritage Sites to South Africa's tourism industry. So we'll start with the concept of a World Heritage Site. You'll see on your screen, World Heritage Sites are places of outstanding universal value and have been awarded international recognition by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, otherwise known as UNESCO. So there are two parts to that um, definition. Firstly, the place or the site must be of outstanding universal value. And secondly, it ha must have been awarded international recognition by UNESCO. If we then continue with the concept of a World Heritage Site, firstly, on your right-hand side of your screen, you will see the following sentence. A site must meet at least one of UNESCO's 10 selection criteria to be awarded international recognition by UNESCO. So, Grade 12, that means that UNESCO has a list of 10 specific selection criteria and if a site meets at least one of those 10 selection criteria it can be awarded international recognition by UNESCO. Further to that a United Nations member country must have signed up to the World Heritage Convention and apply to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee for a site to be proclaimed as a World Heritage Site. And I think we must just spend a few minutes unpacking this statement that you see on your screen. Uh, the first thing that comes up um, on your screen is the fact that uh, in order for a country to have a World Heritage Site, specifically a UNESCO World Heritage Site, that country must be a member of the United Nations. Secondly, that country must have signed up to the World Heritage Convention. Now let's just unpack that a little bit quickly. A convention is in other terms an agreement. And in this case, the World Heritage Convention is an agreement about the process of protecting sites of cultural and natural heritage globally. If we then take a look at 
the third aspect that you can see in that bullet, the country in which the site is located must apply to UNESCO for a site to be proclaimed as a World Heritage Site. So it doesn't just happen. Um, there is a process that must be gone through in order to have a site declared as a World Heritage Site. And let me just remind you, the first one is that that particular country where the site is located must be a member of the United Nations. Secondly, that country must have signed up to the World Heritage Convention. And as a matter of interest, interest there are 193 countries that have signed that agreement uh, globally. And the third criteria is that the country must apply to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee for that site to be proclaimed as a World Heritage Site. Only once uh, the site has been proclaimed will it be included in the World Heritage List. The last two bullets speak to um, the importance of the site. When UNESCO awards World Heritage Site status to a site, the site belongs to all of the people of the world, irrespective of the territory in which the site is located. Because this site is so important that everyone globally must take responsibility to protect the site. So there's just a little bit more information about the concept of a World Heritage Site. If we then take a look at the next slide, slide, you will see that this is the UNESCO logo. I'm referring to the image on the left-hand side. You will see at the bottom the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization with the logo. The image that you see on the right-hand side is the logo of the World Heritage Convention, which I have already explained to you. That was the agreement about the process of the protection of cultural and natural heritage sites globally. So you will often see those sites when you are visiting a World Heritage or those logos once you are visiting a World Heritage Site. Right, Grade 12, now we're going to go on and take a look at the role of UNESCO, their main functions um, that they play and have in this um, maintaining of World Heritage Sites. The first aspect that is, or the first main function that is um, listed on the right hand side of your screen is constant monitor monitoring to maintain and protect the status of the World Heritage Sites. Now, if I go back to what I said previously about the fact that um, the country has to apply for the site to be, to be declared a World Heritage Site, and there are a limited number of World Heritage Sites globally, and obviously that site has a certain status that must be maintained and protected. So that is one of the functions of UNESCO, to constantly maintain and or constantly monitor um, to maintain and protect the status. The second function of UNESCO, as indicated on your screen, is to provide support in terms of management plans. Now, grade 12, you just need to remember here that UNESCO is not responsible for the day-to-day -day management of each and every World Heritage Site globally. But they do provide support in terms of management plans. Thirdly, assistance with upgrading of facilities in the event of an unforeseen occurrence. So if there is perhaps a fire that breaks out at a site or an earthquake, UNESCO will provide assistance with the upgrading of those facilities. And the following function, 
financial aid is provided in the cases of unforeseen occurrences. Again, if a fire breaks out or there's an earthquake at a site, uh, UNESCO does not only provide assistance with upgrading of facilities, they also provide financial aid in the case of unforeseen occurrences. And then UNESCO also engages with relevant stakeholders when World Heritage Sites are in a position of being threatened. We will then um, continue. We're continuing with the main function of UNESCO and that is education and creating awareness. Now, um, the education and the creation of awareness is about all World Heritage Sites globally. UNESCO has a comprehensive website. Um, perhaps when you've got a bit of time, um, go and Google it and you will see that the comprehensive website has information on each and every um, World Heritage Site and there's also information about which World Heritage Sites are in danger or perhaps in danger of losing their status. So that is falls under the bullet of education and creating awareness. UNESCO also promotes cooperation and development. This is between countries, this is between governments, this is between UNESCO and the heritage bodies. So there's cooperation and development on all levels. Another function of UNESCO is to encourage people to nominate sites to be included on the World Heritage Site list. They also provide support to countries in building public awareness for the protection of World Heritage Sites. So they just to summarize those two together UNESCO's one of their functions is to encourage people to nominate sites but also assist countries in creating a public awareness for the protection of that site. And finally you have on your screen encourage the local population to preserve their cultural and natural heritage. And I think that doesn't require any unpacking. Now we take a look at different types of World Heritage Sites. You studied in grade 10, you learnt a little bit about different types of sites and now it comes up again in grade 12 and you will see on your screen one can have a cultural heritage site, one can have a natural heritage site, one can have a mixed heritage site which is both cultural and natural and we also have the concept of a cultural landscape. Now that didn't come up in grade 10 um, but it is also important that you are aware of what a cultural landscape is because when we get to the names of the World Heritage Sites in South Africa that will come up. So if we can take a look at the concept of a cultural landscape, it is a place where people have evolved and interacted with the natural world around them and where this interaction and evolving has had particular significance. Now if I could just draw your attention to the images on your screen. The top image on the right hand side is that of the Grand Canyon. That is a natural heritage site. The bottom left is the Great Wall of China, which is a cultural heritage site. Now, I'd also just like to remind you about the tourism icons that you studied in Term 2. And both these World Heritage Sites that you see on your screen at the moment were also part of the World Icons. So you should recognize those images immediately. 
Now we'll take a look at World Heritage Sites in South Africa. The table on your screen gives you on the left hand side the name of the World Heritage Site, the province in which it is located and the type of World Heritage Site. You will note, looking at the province, that many of those, two of those World Heritage Sites actually are not located in one province but are located in more than one province. So if we take a look at the first one is the Cradle of Humankind which was declared a World Heritage Site way back in 1999 is located in Gauteng, Limpopo and Northwest and is a cultural World Heritage Site. You will of course in the following slide you will see that um, there's a map showing you where these sites are located in South Africa. So we're going to get to that in a second. Secondly, we have Robben Island, which is located in the Western Cape, which is also a cultural heritage site. Mapungubwe, in the far northern part of South Africa in Limpopo province, is also a cultural heritage site. Then you have the Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape, which is in the Northern Cape and is a cultural heritage site. And I would just like to stop here and chat to you a bit about the Richtersveld. Um, it is not a mixed heritage site. It is a cultural heritage site. Um, the focus there is on the culture and how that specific culture interacts with nature. I am aware that there are some textbooks that gives that that give that as a mixed site, but according to UNESCO's website, it is a cultural World Heritage Site. And then the following World Heritage Site is the last of the cultural heritage sites on our list, and that is the Komani Cultural Landscape in the Northern Cape. Then we go on to the natural heritage sites. Firstly is Mangaliso, Wetland Park in KwaZulu-Natal, the Cape Floral Region Protected Areas in the Western Cape, the Friedefort Dome, which is located in both the Free State and Northwest, and our two most recently, no, that's sorry, my mistake, the Barberton Makonjwa Mountains, the, uh, the, the two most recent ones were Kumani 2017 and Barberton Makonjwa Mountains. So Barberton Makonjwa Mountains is located in Pumalanga and it is a natural heritage site and then we have one mixed heritage site in South Africa and that is Ukashlamba Drakensberg Park which is located in KwaZulu-Natal. And as promised the following slide gives you the location of each one on a map of South Africa. I think let's start at the bottom of the map in the Western Cape. There you have in the sea off of the Western Cape, Robben Island. And as I mentioned earlier, Grade 12, I'm not going to unpack each and every um, World Heritage Site in this lesson. That will be done in the follow-up lesson, Part 2 of the lesson on World Heritage Sites. So we're just looking at the location on a map here. You have Robben Island off the Western Cape coast. Then you have the Western Cape, a second World Heritage Site is the Cape Floral Region Protected Areas. Now that is not one site, that is a few sites that are all form part of the Cape Floral Region. Those various sites stretch from the red triangle that you see there right through into the Eastern Cape in the Bavians Kloof. Let's stay on the left-hand side of the map and go up into the Northern Cape. There you have the Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape, right in the far northern part of the Northern Cape, close to the West Coast. If we then continue in the Northern Cape, right up there between the border of South Africa, Namibia and Botswana, you have the Kumani Cultural Landscape. 
If we then continue moving in an easterly direction, the following site that we come to is the Fredeford Dome, which is located in the northern part of the Free State and in the southern part, southeastern part of the northwest province. After that, you have the Cradle of Humankind, which again, if you look at its full name, uh, is a variety of sites and therefore you will see it is located in northwest Gauteng and Limpopo. Now we're still moving towards the east coast. You will see right at the top on the border between Zimbabwe, Botswana and Limpopo province in South Africa, we have the Mapungubwe cultural landscape. Then the next one, if you're moving towards the east coast, you go downwards on your map and you will see on the border between KwaZulu-Natal and Lesotho is Okahlamba Drakensberg Park. Then the next one you have, if you're still moving to the eastern side, is the Barberton Makonjwa Mountains. And the final one there is Isimanga Liso Wetland Park that is on the north coast of KwaZulu Natal. Then we're going to take a look at the value of the World Heritage Sites to South Africa's tourism industry. And as part of the explanation here, I want to refer you to the images each time because they are particular images, in particular images that have been taken in and around Robben Island. So if we look at the value of the World Heritage Sites to the tourism industry of South Africa, you see the first aspect that is taken a look at under there is that sites receive national and international recognition which will result in an increase in visitor numbers. And there you have a number of visitors that are leaving the Robben Island um, prison, that's the entrance to the, the prison there, and you'll see that those tourists have already been on the prison tour. And so because that site receives national and international recognition, it will result in an increase in visitor numbers. And in many cases you will find that the visitors to those sites are special interest tourists. tourists. So the, the primary reason for those tourists wanting to visit South Africa would be to visit some of the World Heritage Sites and in this case particularly Robben Island. An increase in tourist numbers will lead to the creation of job opportunities due to increased demand for services and there you will see, if you look at the images, a variety of job opportunities that one could identify um, that are evident there. Ticket sales for Robben Island, ticket sales for the ferries, um, also job opportunities for people who are employed working on the Robben Island ferries. And finally, on that screen, you will see tourism will generate income due to a demand for products and services. For example, accommodation, transport, entry fees, food, drink, etc. On Robben Island, there is a museum and one can go and purchase various um, mementos of the visit to Robben Island, which generates an income because there is a demand for products and services. On the island you also have a kiosk where food and something to drink can be purchased. So again, that generates income because of the demand for products and services. The same is relevant, relevant when you look at the Robin Island Ferry on the bottom of your screen. There is a demand for a product and service being created through the fact that there is a Robin Island ferry. 
so that generates an income. We then continue with the value of World Heritage Sites to South Africa's tourism industry. And the images that you are seeing on your screen at the moment are images of places in the V&A waterfront. So you should therefore immediately understand the first bullet that says increased visitor numbers will set the multiplier effect into motion. And here you have excellent example of the multiplier effect being set into motion through the tourists that visit the Robben Island World Heritage Site because they will come back to the V&A waterfront or they will start their visit to the Robben Island World Heritage Site at the V&A waterfront and so they will be spending money there. At the top, at the craft market, you have many different curios and African beadwork, skins, artwork that are available. So there is an excellent example of the multiply effect being set into motion. And the bottom image is taken of the V&A waterfront where people are visiting various restaurants there and enjoying the various tourist activities. So immediately that brings the multiply effect into play. And through the fact that that multiply effect has come into play, standards of living will be improved through money directly or indirectly earned by tourism. So you have your standards of living immediately being improved in that region as well as a boost in the economic activity. You will see that many many people are walking around there and visiting the V&A waterfront. They may be on their way to a Robben Island tour or they may have just come back from a, a Robben Island tour. So that is immediately indicative of an economic boost in the area which will then lend itself to an increased contribution of tourism to the GDP and it will most definitely benefit the establishments that are found in the area. Great 12, if I can just touch sides here with you on what you can expect in an exam paper here, uh, you must be able to locate the World Heritage Site on a map you must also be able to recognize an image of the World Heritage Site. Perhaps if I can just give you the example of the Mapungubwe Golden Rhino. Once you see the Golden Rhino, and that was in the very, very first um, slide in this lesson of today, you know that that is Mapungubwe. Then you, there's a very good chance that you will be asked a question that pertains to the value of that site to the South African tourism industry or perhaps even um, under icons, uh, perhaps the value of the icon to the country. So make sure that you are able to remember these items listed under the value of World Heritage Sites and that you are able to link each one to the particular World Heritage Site that you are asked about. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's lesson and as has become the custom, we are going to take a look at an activity. This activity comes from the February-March 2018 NEC question paper. Right at the top of your screen, it reads as follows. Study the map below and answer the questions that follow. Then you have a map of the Southern Africa region and you have a number of World Heritage Sites identified and listed A to H. Your legend says World Heritage Sites in South Africa. You have to read carefully with this question. Match the location of the World Heritage Sites A to H on the map 
with the names of the World Heritage Sites 5.1.1 to 5.1.5. Write only the letters A to H next to the question number in the answer book. For example, 5.1.6J. Now what you will find um, that follow on that is a list of World Heritage Sites and their numbers. 511 is Ismanga Liso Wetland Park. 512 is the Frederford Dome. 513 is the Cradle of Humankind. 514 the, Richt the Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape. 515 Ukashamba Drakensberg Park. You will see grade 12 that that is the official correct name. You must know the in whole name. You cannot just take talk about the Richtersveld. It must be the full name of Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape. So if we take a look at what you are required to do here. You have been given the number, you have been given the name. You are to match the location of the site together with the name of the site. So that means that if you are looking at 5.1.1, you have Isimangaliso Wetland Park, you must then identify the number on the map that refers to the Isimangaliso Wetland Park. So that's why I said to you right at the beginning of this question, you need to read it very carefully because it's easy to get confused. 5.1.2 is the Frederford Dome, so you need to identify the letter that represents the Frederford Dome. 5.1.3, the Cradle of Humankind, which letter represents the Cradle of Humankind. 5.1.4, the Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape. You must ask yourself the question, which letter represents that cultural and botanical landscape? And 5.1.4, 15 Ukashamba Drakensberg Park. Which letter on the map represents that park? I hope that you are able to answer this because I'm going to put the answers up on the screen now. Let's check if you were right. 511 is E, and E you will see is Ismagaliso Wetland Park, which is located in the northern part of KwaZulu Natal on the eastern coast of South Africa. The Frederford Dome is, if you look at your map, is B and that is located in the northern part of the Free State. C is the Cradle of Humankind which is slightly diagonally up from B. 514 is A the Richtersveld Cultural and Botanical Landscape, and A is located right on the border between Namibia and the Northern Cape, and Ukashamba Drakensberg Park is indicated on the map as F. Then the next part of the question says, study the information below and answer the questions that follow. We have the role of UNESCO, and a sentence that reads as follows, UNESCO strives to build networks among nations and created the idea of world heritage to protect unique sites across the world for future generations to enjoy. On the right hand side there you will see the UNESCO logo and as well as that of the World Heritage Convention. Now you are asked to state two aspects that UNESCO looks for when they are considering sites for World Heritage status. Firstly, sites must be of outstanding value and sites must meet at least one out of ten of UNESCO's selection criteria. The following question discussed two advantages for the South African tourism industry 
if South Africa is awarded another World Heritage Site. Now that talks in immediately to the value of the World Heritage Site for the South African tourism industry. And there's a whole lot of possible answers given on the screen. If South Africa is awarded another World Heritage Site, it will attract more special interest tourists to the country. There will be more exposure and publicity for South Africa on an international platform. Increased visitor numbers um, to the province where the new World Heritage Site is located will be the following aspect to consider. Local traditions and cultures at the new site will be showcased. More opportunities for entrepreneurship at the new site. The multiply effect will come into motion. There will be an increase in the GDP. More sites of significance are then protected for future generations. Job opportunities are created. And there's also a positive impact on the geographical spread of tourists, which means that tourists don't only go to one area of the country, they visit a variety of areas. Now, if you were paying attention right at the end of the lesson the, to the value of a World Heritage Site for the tourism industry of the country and the images of Robben Island, when I discuss those bullets with you, you should immediately be recognizing them, um, some of them that have come up on the screen now. Right, great talk. That brings us to the end of today's lesson. I hope you found it insightful, and I most certainly hope that you will join us in the last, the, f the following and final lesson based on World Heritage Sites in South Africa.